So we're on uh, number 32.18, talking about the infallibility of the church and the arguments in favor of it. Argument two, Jesus spoke to the college of the apostles in this manner, and Jesus coming spoke to them saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Going therefore teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. God bless you. Sounds like you're coming down with it, whatever it is. In such a way, the following things are promised, A, infallibility in the faith, B, to not only the apostles but to the church, C, until the end of the world. This is proved. The words, I am with you, and similar words by which God promises that he will be with some work to be done in the future or in performing some function, one in sacred scripture signifies that that work will certainly be done. For example, in Exodus 2, 11 and 12, it says, And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said to him, I will be with thee. So there are quite a few instances in the Old Testament of being with, that idea of, of accompaniment, <laughs> uh, but in a good sense. In other words, uh, that, that the power of God will, will be with him. Um, uh, same uh, Genesis, Deuteronomy, all these others. To the happy outcome of the work is easily understood from the words which are quoted, since the Lord declares that He will be, will, we will be, uh, He will be the sponsor of what needs to be done. So he's telling them, "Here's a function, and I will assist you in it." Having said these things, I reason this way: a Christ promised that He would grant prosperity to the work of teaching the faith. When he said, going therefore teach, and I will be with you. But this promise done in order that the faith be preached certainly includes infallibility. For, one, the special assistance of Christ is promised, and therefore the happy outcome in, in teaching each and every article of faith, when it is commanded, teach them to observe all things which I have commanded you. So they, they have this mission. This is the solemn mission to the apostles. Two, if one should deny infallibility according to its true sense, then the aforesaid assistance means nothing. For if it were possible that the faith of the church could defect in any article, then we would always be in doubt whether this or that should be believed in fact or not. Therefore, by the quoted words, infallibility in faith is truly promised. See, so that, that's what essentially recognize and resist is going to do, is put in doubt anything that the Pope says. A Pope, not obviously. It's going to ruin the, the sense of the infallibility of the church in Catholics. B, the promise of infallibility was made to the church and not only to the apostles. For one, the apostolic college represented the church of Christ. Two, the promises are ordered to teaching all peoples. But the, this work of preaching begun by the apostles must be continued by the successors of the apostles until the end of the world. So the, the apostles did not achieve, nor could have achieved, all peoples. Three, the promises are extended beyond the age of the apostles until the end of the world. Therefore, the assistance promised pertains to the apostles not exclusively as persons, but as to a moral body to remain in their successors. See, infallibility is promised until the end of the world, for it is said all days until the consummation of the world. This consummation is either the end of the apostolic age 
or it is the end of the world. But the second must be the one affirmed as true. One, from the words in themselves, which should not be restricted. I mean, how could you take that in any other way except the end of the world? Two, from the use of the sacred scriptures, for besides this place, the term consummation of the world occurs in four other places in the New Testament and always signifies the end of the world. No one contradicts this. So in Matthew 13, uh, 39, Christ, in explaining the parable of the cockle, says, the harvest, however, is the consummation of the world. So, and don't forget, in Mark, he adds that those who do not believe shall be condemned. Well, how could you be condemned if there is not a guarantee of infallibility? You could say, well, I disagree. I think you're wrong. How could you be condemned if, if there is not this divine assistance? Argument three, the Savior promises three times the spirit of truth. And among other things uses these words, and I will ask the Father and he shall give you another paraclete that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth. But the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind whatsoever I shall have said to you. So that's that assistance. He will bring all things to your mind. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all truth. Which is an internal assistance. But this is a, a promise of infallibility in the faith. B, which is promised to the church not only and not only to the apostles. And C, is to be continued until, until the end of the wor world. Proof of the minor. Infallibility in the faith is granted to them by which the Holy Ghost himself is promised for that very end that they teach all truth, but it is promised by Christ. The minor is evident from the quoted text where we read explicitly, he will teach you all things, all things whatsoever I have said to you, all truth. B, the promise is made to the church. The body of the apostles represented the church. The purpose of the mission of the Holy Ghost is extended as well to the successors of the apostles, since that purpose is the whole business of preaching, as is evident from what follows. But when the paraclete cometh, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceedeth from the Father, he shall give testimony of me. And when he has come, he will convince the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. He shall glorify me. The word forever was able to be said only of a moral body and not of the persons of the apostolic college. The quoted texts are connected with John 17, 20, where Jesus, when he is praying, says, and not for them only do I pray, but for them also who through their word shall believe in me. Until the end of the world, Christ said forever, but the sense of this statement is until the end of the world, as three things will prove. One, this statement signifies in many places of sacred scripture the length of all the ages. To the end of the mission of the Holy Ghost just quoted, and the analogy with the promises in Matthew 16, 18, that's the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and 28, 18 to 20, and with the doctrine of St. Paul in 2 Tim 1 Timothy, which we saw, demand this meaning. I think that's 2 Timothy, right? Three, St. John confirm, seems to confirm this meaning when he writes concerning the faithful 
who know all the truth, because of the truth which remains in us and will be with us forever. Confirmation from the prophecies of the Old Testament. A, to the kingdom of Christ, which is the church, the perpetuity and firmness were promised by the prophets. But perpetuity and firmness in the church cannot even be thought of without infallibility. For faith in the kingdom of Christ is its root and foundation. For this reason, the fathers take this verse of Osi to refer to the church. And I will espouse thee to me forever. And I will espouse thee to me in justice and judgment and in mercy and in commiserations. And I will espouse thee to me in faith, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. That the church would last forever, the prophets predicted, when they foretold that Christ would reign in it forever. B. There is this prophecy of Isaiah, This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is in thee, and my words that I have put in my mouth, in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Later he says, Thou shalt no more have the sun for thy light by day, neither shall the brightness of the moon enlighten thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee for an everlasting light, and thy God for thy glory. Thy sun shall go down no more, and thy moon shall not decrease, for the Lord shall be unto thee for an everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. These things seem to refer to the church, therefore the faith of the church will not fail. And then uh, other arguments from Luke 22, 31, 30. <clears throat> Twenty two. Uh, that's uh, and and the Lord said, Simon, 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 behold, hath uh, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and thou, being once converted, confirm thy brethren. And John twenty one fifteen to seventeen. When therefore they had uh, dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? He saith to him, yes, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, to him, Feed my lambs. And then the rest goes on, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Those texts are on the, the cornice of St. Peter's Basilica. That's what you, those, those three texts, the uh, Tu es Petrus, and the uh, I have prayed for thee, Peter. It's on the left side as you go in. And then... Uh, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And that's where you see the Greek, just as a reminder to the, they put that al also in Greek, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. All right. From the Father's argument, one negatively, those who deny the infallibility of the church assert 
not only that the church is subject to errors, but also that it could happen, that it could believe and profess for many centuries the most foul errors. For they say that this happened in the Roman church, outside of which no church was seen for many centuries. But the fathers never affirmed, even with one word, or even speculated in any way that it could happen, that the church of Christ could fall e e even into one error. Therefore, infallibility is much more in conformity with the mind of the fathers. See, so that, that's the Protestant position from the, you know, the church. Derailed at a very early time. And, and stayed in the in the pit until St. Martin Luther came along. Well, the whole thing is ridiculous. Argument two from the Apostolic Fathers, given certain circumstances, it is certain that the Apostolic Fathers believed that the church was infallible. Therefore, the faith of the church is not able to defect. I said, given certain circumstances, which are one, the paucity of works, which were either written by the Apostolic Fathers or which survive. See, so Apostolic Fathers are those who are in the first century AD who knew the apostles or uh, were very close in some way to the Apostolic Age to the nature and matter of the works which do not treat of our controversies, because many of them just don't talk about it. Three, the doctrine of sacred scripture, which outshined the apostolic fathers, as well as the doctrine of the subsequent fathers who declared the faith received from the apostolic age. See, so the subsequent fathers say more. Clement of Rome, St. Clement of Rome, so he's in 90s AD, and St. Ignatius of Antioch, he's early, he was martyred in the early 100s AD, teach the greatest union of Christ with his church. St. Ignatius says, where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. But it is impossible that such a union not affect, well, and that means it's with an E, a church which is absolutely firm in the faith. How could you identify the church with Jesus Christ if it's not absolutely firm in the faith? For this reason, the author of the epistle to Diogenes, chapter 11, preaches that it is the Son of God through whom the church is enriched. The faith of the Gospels is made firm and the tradition of the apostles is guarded, and the grace of the church rejoices. Likewise, in the pastor of Hermes, that's an early document, first century, the tower, which is the church founded upon a rock, is said to be, in fact, the Son of God. He adds, the tower becomes one stone with the rock, which seems to indicate a, indi indicate a great firmness of faith. So just you know, applying this to our present day, you know, it's not sufficient to say, well, you know, there's been nothing infallible said and you know, the church has not bound us. The fact that you could have universal preaching and teaching from the Vatican and the whole body of bishops contrary to faith affects all of this. It's, it's, that it, it's not, doesn't help you, the argument of recognize and resist that none of this that has come out of Vatican II is infallible and therefore we're, you know, we're not concerned about it. These are things that are preached contrary to faith. Ecumenism, for example. And the result is that billions of people have acquired notions contrary to faith as a res direct result of this false teaching of Vatican II. So that, that necessarily argues that the people doing this are intruders and do not represent the church.
Otherwise, you have to associate that defection from the faith from, with, with the Catholic Church, and all of this makes no sense. So it'd be one thing if they taught, as I said yesterday, that, or you know, some sort of social thing that if, uh, retirement insurance is a good idea. Say, or some other uh, comment on social issues. Obviously, that's not infallible, but that it does not offend the faith. See, and some, some other pope could say, I don't think it's a good idea that there should be retirement insurance or that labor needs capital or capital needs labor. He, you know, that's, that does not affect the integrity of faith because those things do not pertain to revelation. But when you have doctrines which are contrary to revealed and, and uh, universally taught doctrines, then you have a, 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 none of this would make sense. You have a, a, this agency that is supposedly protected by, by God spewing out to the whole world uh, ideas that destroy their faith because they're contrary to faith, contrary to the teaching that outside the church there is no salvation. That's a dogma of faith. Ecumenism destroys that. You can't be an ecumenist and at the same time hold extra ecclesiam nulla salus. And that's why Vatican II explicitly teaches that that the ho the holy the spirit of God has not hesitated to use non-Catholic religions as means of salvation, means of salvation. That's the heresy. They are not means of salvation. Because you can't go and do ecumenism with these heretics and schismatics by telling them, oh, by the way, your church. Is, is a means of damnation because if it isn't a means of salvation, it's something else. And there's only one other thing it could be. And now, in other words, if you were uh, pertinacious in schism, pertinacious in heresy in those sects, you're going to hell. Now, God knows who's pertinacious and who isn't, but you can't judge the value of a thing, say, from, the, from a defect of an act. In other words, in itself, it preaches schism and heresy, whether it's the Protestantism, whether it's the Orthodox, schism and heresy, objectively. And if you come back from schism or heresy, the church presumes that you were pertinacious. That's why the excommunication is lifted and you have to make a, there's a, a legal presumption of it. Even if in your soul you were not, there's a legal presumption of it because of the externals of it. You were in a sect that, that was, had broken from Rome or which, and, or which held heretical ideas. See, so, that, that's the problem of Vatican II, and you should insist on that. That, that. that excuse of, well, this was not infallible, therefore it could be wrong, does not help this. <laughs> it's a deviation from faith. It is a contradiction of true faith and leads people to hell. And it is, look at it. Look at the destruction that has been wrought since 1958. It's like a nuclear bomb that has hit the Catholic Church, leaving it in ashes. Oh, sure, there are churches and bishops and mitres, etc., but inside it's all rotten. And people have abandoned the faith, perhaps not knowing and not willing but they have, in fact, abandoned the faith. They say things, 
I hear it all the time when I talk to Novus Ordites. It doesn't matter what religion you belong to, and as long as you believe in God, you're a good person. It, that, that, that's drilled into them. So th that's an important point to make is that th we're not dealing, you know, with whether, uh, as I said, we should have national health insurance you know, or, or uh, Bison 12th gave a talk once how scientists should do more research on the sun, <laughs> S-U-N. I mean... You know, a Pope could come along and say, I don't agree with Pius XII. I don't think we need to do any research on the sun. <laughs> he was always uh, interested in scientific things. And, uh, he, he gave these addresses to all sorts of people that came to him, all kinds of doctors and, you know, and, and, uh, and many times scientists, and he would comment on certain scientific things. So, uh, I mean, be that as it may, it's just that the the certain things that do not pertain to revelation, which could be wrong, they're not infallible, so they could be wrong, but that does not in any way harm what we're talking about here. We're talking about matters of faith. So, the, um, the Apostolic Fathers affirm that salvation is found in the church and a remedy against errors. That they walk in the light who are joined to the church. Those who think in a heretical manner are entirely separated from the church of Christ. They profess that heresy is a lethal drug. See, they were not very ecumenical. That's why that business of going back to the early church. Well, let's go back to the early church and hear some of the things that they had to say. But that's what they said. When I, I, I lived through it, that was it. We're going back to the early church. That was the justification for Vatican II. Going back to the early church. Okay. <laughs> oh, they, they came out. I mean, they put chocolate sauce all over the whole thing. I remember it. And ecumenism was, well, we're going to draw all of these people back to the church. That's the way they presented it, that we're going to reach out to them and try to bring them back. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, you think, oh, this isn't, isn't this nice? And, you know, what a... Of course. <laughs> Which the church had done for many centuries. It didn't need a general council to do that. But that's the way they presented it. Then little by little, you found out that other things were on the agenda. In addition to these, St. Ignatius of Antioch warns the Philadelphians in this manner, keep yourselves from those evil plants which Jesus Christ does not tend because they are not the planting of the Father. Not that I have found any division among you, but exceeding purity. For as many as are of God and of Jesus Christ are also with the bishop. Again, so much for recognize and resist and carrying on an anti-apostolate while at the same time recognizing the apostolic authority vested in Bergoglio and his bishops. For as many as are of God and of Jesus Christ are also with the bishop. And as many as shall in the exercise of repentance return to the unity of the church these two shall belong to God, that they may live according to Jesus Christ. So much for ecumenism. 
The same saint condemns those who try to disturb the church with evil doctrines. Do not err, my brethren, that those that corrupt families shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If then those who do this as respects the flesh have suffered death, how much more shall this be the case with anyone who corrupts the wicked doctrine, by wicked doctrine, the faith of God, for which Jesus Christ was crucified? This, not, this does not bode well for the Novus Ordo clergy. Such a one becoming defiled in this way shall go away into everlasting fire, and so shall every one that hearkens unto him. For this end did the Lord suffer the ointment to be poured upon his head, that he might breathe immortality into his church. Be, ye not, be not ye anointed with the bad odor of the doctrine of the prince of this world. Let him not lead you away captive from the life which is set before you. And why are we not all prudent, since we have received the knowledge of God, which is Jesus Christ? Those are chilling words from a very early father. Who was eaten by lions for the faith in Rome. St. Polycarp who was the disciple of St. John the Evangelist so vigorously defends that fact that one must adhere to the church that when Marcion, the heretic, said to him, recognize me, he is said to have answered, I recognize the firstborn of the devil. See, that was an ecumenical service. <laughs> That's from Eusebius, who was a very respected historian. He was an Arian, but he was a very respected historian. Of the church. The same saint said to the Philippians, abandoning the vanity and false doctrines of many. That's not the saint Eusebius we just had. Eusebius was a very common name. Abandoning the vanity and false doctrines of many, let us return to the doctrine which was handed to us from the beginning. In chapter 3, he says, You will be able to be edified if you look into the epistles of St. Paul with faith which has been given to you, which faith is the mother of us all. In fact, St. Irenaeus affirmed, in this, who was a disciple of St. Polycarp, uh, in the sight of God that blessed Polycarp, if he heard that the heresy of uh, Florinus, he would have cried out and stopped his ears, exclaiming as he was wont to do, O good God, for what times hast thou reserved me that I should endure these things? Imagine what he would do today. He would have to go around with earmuffs on or one of the, you know, like what they would use for the, the bells. And he would have fled from the very spot where sitting or standing he had heard such words. He would have no place to live on the whole earth. I mean, you see this, this holy hatred of heresy in these men as being contrary to Christ, to God, to everything that is holy and right, true. I mean, they, they had a burning, burning and a true hatred for heresy. From these things, it is apparent to what extent the fathers agreed that the Church of Christ was maximally distant from any error. Argument three, from some other fathers, St. Irenaeus, the disciple of St. Polycarp, after he expressed apostolic succession, says this, it is not necessary to seek the truth among others, which it is easy to obtain from the church, since the apostles, like a rich man depositing his money in a bank, lodged in her hands most copiously all things pertaining to the truth, so that every man, whoever will, it can draw from her the water of life, for she is the entrance to life. All others are thieves and robbers. <clears throat> the 
the same saint says that faith is said to be in the church always by the Spirit of God renewing its youth as if it were some precious deposit in an excellent vessel, causing the vessel itself uh, containing it to renew its youth also. He says in the same place, where the church is, there is the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of God is, there is the church and all grace. And St. Ambrose will say, Ubi Petrus, Ibi Ecclesia, and Ubi Ecclesia, where there is the church, there, will, there is all grace. That's St. Ambrose. <laughs> he will be Petrus Ibi Ecclesia, where, where Peter is, there is the church. He was late 300s, early 400s. I think he died in the early 400s. <clears throat> he was the one that refused to let Theodosius into the cathedral of Milan. That was the capital of the empire at the time. Milan, they moved it to Milan. And uh, uh, Theodosius said, well, even David was forgiven. And um, Ambrose said, well, follow David's penitence, penance first, and then we'll <laughs> <laughs> So he gave him a penance. He, he had to do... Uh, uh, significant, severe penance for the slaughter in uh, what was the town? I forget. I forget the town, but uh, in Greece, because there was an uprising against the emperor's um, representative in that town. It occurred during a chariot race. It was a big uprising, and uh, no, there was uh, no. I'm sorry. The slaughter occurred in the chariot race. They were all in the stadium. And the th soldiers of Theodosius came in and slaughtered m when men, women, and children. It was terrible, and Ambrose was horrified. Forget the town. Was it? So, uh, but the spirit is truth. You see, so... And the, where the Spirit of God is, there is the church and all grace, but the Spirit is truth. So he's combining grace, church, Holy Ghost, and truth, all as if one thing. And in chapter 20, he adds, And undoubtedly the preaching of the church is true and steadfast, in which one and the same way of salvation is shown throughout the whole world, for to it has been entrusted the light of God. Clement of Alexandria, he ceases to be a man of God and faithful to the Lord who resists the ecclesiastical tradition and has descended into the opinions of human heresies. Origen, we ought not to pay attention to those who say, Behold Christ, but who do not point him out in the church, which is filled with the true light, which is the pillar and ground of truth. St. Athanasius, it is sufficient to respond to the paradoxes of the heretics with only these words. These things are not the Catholic Church, not of the Catholic Church. Tertullian, he teaches that the infallibility of the Church can be denied only with absurdity. Grant, then, that all have erred, that the Apostle was mistaken in giving his testimony that the Holy Ghost had no such respect to any one church as to lead it into truth, although sent with this view by Christ, and for this asked of the Father that he might be the teacher of truth. Grant also that he, the steward of God, the vicar of Christ, neglected his office, permitting the churches for a time to understand differently and to believe differently what he himself was preaching by the apostles. It is... It is likely that so many churches, and they so great, should have gone astray into one and the same faith. 
no casualty distributed among many men issues in one and the same result. Error of doctrine in the churches must necessarily have produced various issues. When, however, that which is de de deposited among many is found to be one and the same, it is not the result of error but of tradition. Can anyone then be reckless enough to say that the, they were in error who handed on the tradition? St. Jerome, I was able to dry up all the little rivers of false propositions in one son of the church. St. Augustine, this same is the Holy Church, the one church, the true church, the Catholic Church, fighting against all heresies. Fight, it can be fought down, it cannot. As for heresies, they all went out of it, like a, as an unprofit, unprofitable branches pruned from the vine, but itself abides in its root, in its vine, in its charity. Argument four, from the practice of the church and monuments. It was always the practice of the church that whoever should dissent from the Catholic Church should be considered a heretic. This public fact has been shown forth by the histories of all heresies and by most certain decrees of the councils and the pontiffs. In the monuments are seen, one, the dove, these are the, the in the catacombs and other ancient monuments, which is the Holy Ghost resting upon a chair, which is the sign of ecclesiastical magisterium. This is found in the graffiti of the cemetery at Duos Lauros. A pillar upon which the monogram of Christ is seen placed between St. Peter and Paul. A ship which is borne by a fish or dolphin, the symbol of Christ. A certain picture in the cemetery of St. Callistus expresses divine protection in this manner. A small boat in the middle of the sea is tossed by the waves which throw a man overboard, soon so it seems to perish. But to another man who is praying in the small boat, the arm of God from the cloud offer help and the ark which does not undergo shipwreck but by which men are delivered from the waves so those are those are uh, antique works of art found uh, relatively primitive works of art but nonetheless they express the faith in the church Objections. Infallibility is permit, pernicious to the human race. Therefore, Christ did not concede it to his church. Proof of the antecedent. He who believes himself to be infallible, since he neglects a further investigation of the truth, becomes inert. He spurns with a fanatical intolerance the opinions of those who disagree, but these things are extremely pernicious. <clears throat> Response. I deny the antecedent. For the proof I distinguish, infallibility gen generates per se inertia and intolerance I deny. Through abuse, let it pass. Divine assistance directs man in knowing the truth. It does not diminish, however, human activity, which is exercised in many sciences through the light of natural reason, since there is no faculty of investigation or object of impulse which is removed by infallibility. So, for example, the... It, it is incumbent upon the church to investigate revelation, to investigate the teaching of the fathers, to, to uh, uh, consult theologians, etc. For example, uh, Bishop Gerard de Laurier was on the commission appointed by Pius XII for the um, definition of the assumption. So, it's very typical, and they, they, uh, he says he, he prayed again and again in that in the cyclical in that bull, uh, after having prayed and consulted the bishops of the church and consulted you know this you know so they don't do it they don't get up one morning and say you know I think I'll have an infallible statement tonight and it it's no they they are assisted they are not, they are not inspired they are assisted okay now. Even if they did, even if he did get up 
and say, I'm going to do an available statement. He would still be assisted, but it is incumbent upon him to research all of that. Same at Pius IX, we just had all the lessons in the breviary. He said essentially the same thing, that, that this was asked for by bishops and faithful throughout the world, that the, there is a whole history of the, of the Immaculate Conception and, and so forth, you know, the, the, giving all of the, the uh, theological justification for making this statement all of what you call the loci theologici, the, the theological places literally in Latin, that means uh, theological sources, sources of definition or sources of evidence of the doctrine. Fathers, tradition itself, the common belief of the faithful. If the, if the faithful believes something commonly, it's because it's being preached commonly. It's not that they're getting beams from heaven. That's modernist. It doesn't come from below, it comes from above, that the hierarchy is teaching these things. So if there's a general belief of the faithful, general, in other words, not every single person, but a general moral unanimity of, of belief among the faithful. Uh, so, nor is the tolerance of charity and certitude removed, but only the tolerance of indifferentism. So the tolerance of charity is one thing, the to tolerance of indifferentism is a whole other thing. The tolerance of charity is that you tolerate an evil in order to either accomplish a greater good or you, in order to avoid a greater evil. That's the tolerance of charity. And tolerance does not mean permission. It means looking the other way. It means not saying anything. But it doesn't mean a permission. It's to look the other way. That's what tolerance is. And it's justified and even morally demanded uh, in order to particularly avoid a greater evil. Yes? Well, it's usually not on a speculative level. It's usually on a practical level, almost always. Uh, that, uh, like, to tolerate... Uh, false religions, uh, the Jews, for example, were always tolerated in medieval Europe. Uh, well, always. Uh, and up to a certain point. <laughs> in other words, until they started making trouble. But in France, there were Jews. In England, there were Jews. Uh, and they were tolerated in the sense that, obviously, the church does not approve of keeping the Old Testament alive, uh, but their presence was tolerated, you see. In other words, the, the, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the popes uh, railed against a number of people in Europe who were persecuting Jews in the Middle Ages, notably in Germany. Now, that doesn't mean he's in favor of Judaism. It's just he, he's saying that these people are here. Uh, and, uh, and they also took measures, the Christian world took measures to prevent them from doing things that might harm Christianity. See, but there was, they were still tolerated up to a point and uh, eventually they got expelled from practically every country in Europe. England expelled them, France eventually expelled them, Spain expelled them, uh, Portugal. Um, that's why Spinoza ended up in Holland. Holland was, as I always said, the <laughs> refuge <laughs> in a bad sense the refuge of sinners <laughs> the i mean they took everything the only people that couldn't get along in holland were the pilgrims because even the dutch couldn't take them <laughs> so they had to go to the wilderness of the new world uh and that's you know where we get thanksgiving but the <laughs> although that has catholic origins in england the harvest uh 
festival or meal. It would take place in October in England because that's being more north. Their harvest was in late September or October. But here the, it takes place in November. In Canada, it's in uh, October. And I said to Canadians, which one do you observe? Canadians living in the U.S., which one do you observe, the Canadian one or the uh, American one? He says, we do both. 